Ahead of us loomed a tall, curved building of feminine grace, adorned with large gemstones and crystalline latticework. If the Ministry of Wartime Technology building was the king of Ministry Walk, then the Ministry of Image was clearly the queen. Everywhere else, the Ministry of Image preferred to keep itself invisible, a shadowy hoof supporting the others from behind the scenes. The Canterlot hub of the Ministry was a showpiece, the name of the Ministry wrapping around the facade in diamond-studded letters. Rarity, the mayor of the Ministry, had never appeared in any publication, poster, or product of the Ministry of Image. Here, she stood proudly before her Ministry, as an alabaster statue lording over a fountain of crystal, glass, and diamond dust. My plan, which had largely amounted to run, seemed to be working. Velvet Remedy and Steelhooves galloped beside me as we passed behind the dead trees that lined the park. My lungs were burning, fighting for breath. My head pounded and my vision blurred. I could feel the strain on my heart and muscles as the pink cloud attacked every part of my body, inside and out. Still, no harassment from our enemies. I had two red lights on my EFS compass. Look sharp, Steelhooves called out, his visor giving him the same warning. I didn't see any pony. Either they were invisible, or they were hiding in the draped alcoves of the Ministry. Calamity beat his wings, soaring upwards, wary of all accords on the roof. It all happened in less than three seconds. We charged around the Rarity Fountain, and right into the trap. Beep, 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 beep. Proximity mines. A lot of them. Many of which were magically energy-based, virtually paved the space between Rarity and the front door of the Ministry of Image. Many of them had already begun to flash, as Velvet Remedy and Steel Hooves drew to a stop next to me. My horn was already glowing as a field of levitation swept over the mines. The two Olicorns stepped out of their hiding places and sat down, becoming statues as they instantly erected the Olicorn shield around us, trapping us inside it with the mines. Pyrelite, who had been keeping pace with us, smacked into the inside of the shield and fell to the ground amongst the mines, dazed. Beep, 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 beep. I parted the sea of beeping mines, shoving them into piles against the shield right next to the olicorns, as I magically switched on the broadcaster, which I had attached to my pit buck. Velvet Remy telekinetically pulled Pyrelite back and wrapped us in her own magical shield. My head exploded in agony. My vision swam with red. Beside me, Velvet Remedy started to scream as the broadcaster's deadly necromancy attacked her as she held the spell. The alicorns jerked, opening their muzzles in a twisted cry of anguish, their shields dissolving. The mines exploded into a calico of fire, shrapnel, concussive force, and magical energy. Blam! Blam! The turret exploded as Little Macintosh sent two armor-piercing bullets through its innards. A twin shot from Clemmy's battle saddle took out the last of the six security turrets. Compared to the security systems we had run into in the other buildings, this had been almost too easy. I stumbled into a plush bench, face-planting into the cushions, and caught my breath. The others settled down. Embedded healing potions. The pink cloud had harmed us more than the Olicorn's trap, and the turrets combined. I could smell something foul from the cushion, but I didn't care. Even at a glance, I could see that much of the Ministry of Image had succumbed to rot and decay. The furnishings and decor had been chosen for appearance, not longevity. This don't bode well, Calamity said with a grimace. I looked up wearily, pulling out a healing potion of my own. Shoving myself away from the blissful cushionness of the bench, I moved to where he was flying. Clamity was looking behind the lobby greeting counter. Steel Rangers. Dead. More than half a dozen of them. Sent by Cottage Cheese to receive the Black Book. Steel Hooves noted solemnly, joining us. Yep, but what killed him? And who laid him out like this? I shook my head. Not a good sign indeed. I turned away, tipping my potion and letting its healing liquid pour down my tongue 
and throat. Clement was flying over the bodies, pulling ammunition from the battle saddles. Velvet was looking over the image directory, hanging on a wall between two columns of twisted marble. Where we were... Uh, where were we expecting to find this book? Velva questioned. Rarity's desk. A secret safe in her office. Velvet nodded. There's an executive elevator. For once, we might actually be able to get in and out quickly, as little Pip keeps hoping. Clamity coughed into his hoof. A cough that sounded a lot like a comment about liking mares. Rolling my air eyes, I checked the map and started towards the elevator. It was just down the right hoof hall and around the corner. The hall was hung with black lit posters in gilded frames, each boasting the merits of the other ministries. I pulled up short as I rounded the corner. The executive elevator was between two progress posters, one of which was the familiar image of the glee filled mare and her hover robot, the other a group of ponies staring in awe at a glowing terminal. The elevator itself was richly designed, gilded with gold, and stuck open by the dead body of a steel ranger knight. The body of a scribe lay crumbled inside, slowly rotting. Her horn in the top of her skull had exploded, painting the back of the elevator car. Soft static poured out of the speaker on the roof of the elevator car. Maybe we shouldn't take the elevator, Velvet suggested as she caught up with me. As we wove through the maze of terminals, monitors, and meeting tables that seemed to be the bulk of the media oversight, I was struck by the lack of skeletons and other signs of dead ponies. Not just in the Ministry of Image, but in the Ministry of Peace and Arcane Sciences as well. Perhaps it was the site in the Ministry of Wartime Technology's atrium that had reminded me that something was missing. There were only dead here were Steel Rangers. Other than one message written in blood, there was no indication of pony death in Twilight's ministry either. The lighting in the room flickered on the verge of giving out. When we had switched them on, two of the light fixtures had exploded. Steelus paused, looking just a line of disgust or dust-covered mainframes along the side of the building. This room alone could have killed them, he commented, just by seeing the technology perverted here and knowing they were only here for a book. I glanced at a nearby terminal, this one still glowing. Curious, I drew out my hacking tool. It was an extremely easy terminal to access. The password was Glitter. Media Oversight, Intra-Office me Memo, Number 057. Just a reminder and clarification for ponies new to Media Oversight's Division of Imagery. All pictures of ponies, including multiple non-specific individuals are required to have at least two to one ratio of ponies with bold or pastel palettes to ponies whose coats and mane bear neutral colors such as brown, gray, or tan. A three to one ratio is preferable. The only exception to this is for the ponies with white coats. White is Celestia's color and it is always permissible in any amount. Likewise, be sure that any planned photography be coordinated with at least one of imagery's pegasi. We want the image of Equestria to be one of glorious sunny days and bright starry nights. Overcast skies are to be strictly avoided unless required for effect. Color correction may be employed to make the sky over Equestria an even deeper blue. In addition, remember that all images of zebras are to be monochromatic. Color photography should be rendered black and white or pass through a desaturation and palette correction spell. Attached is a list of appropriate tints for zebra imagery, but a good rule of hoof is that any coloration that gives the image a demonic or sickly appearance. Personal Memo Dear Shutterbright, While I do appreciate your artistic thinking, and I agree that a bright and beautiful equestria is a most desirable aesthetic, I must decline your proposal that all imagery of Equestria display a sunny day. Please remember that Princess Luna sits on the throne now. Let us not set policy designed to wound her. Sincerely, Rarity. Media Oversight, 
Intra-Office Memo, number 162. All ponies with media oversight are required to attend the mandatory employee meeting tomorrow, starting promptly at 8. In this meeting, we will be giving you an overview of our new radio override system. Thanks to the assistance from the Ministry of Awesome, we have been able to accomplish and establish an equestria-wide system for emergency interruption or enhancement of radio broadcasts. All ponies in media oversight will need to be familiar with the basics of this new system and how to access the ROS from either one or either of the media oversight offices or the base station in any of the MAW towers. The meeting is expected to last two hours. Lemon cakes and tea will be served. Uh, Lil Pip? Clemity said, staring at a dead monitor. Across it, somebody had painted a message. They eat your soul. Can we just go home now? The Pegasus moaned. I didn't blame him. We continued on, even more alert and cautious than before. A dragon? Velvet Remedy gasped, echoing my own sentiment. Pyrelight let out a, wound, a worried hoot. Yep, Calamity asserted as he flew over the book bins and tables of restricted publications. The rest of us had to walk around them. From what I could discern, the very long table I was passing had once been where a small legion of unicorns had magically coveted books into new editions. There were bins for books beside each workstation, one labeled inappropriate and the other labeled corrected. A poster on a nearby bookcase showed the dark blue earth pony reading over a book with more stacked on each side. The poster read, Be diligent. Check your work. We had passed through a book office to get to this room. That makes it so much more difficult, Stulips commented. I do not believe we have the firepower to kill a dragon of that age. Velvet Omni frowned. You ponies do realize this is probably Spike's mother we're talking about, right? She nickered. Show a little compassion. I winced. But right now, she was a threat to Equestria. A giant living pink cloud factory. I don't think we have to, Calamity stated. Kill her, I mean. The crazy alicorn lady already solved the problem for us. She's already dead? I exclaimed in surprise. Clemity shook his head. It seems the alicorn got a hold of a spell that'll turn her big mother dragon into something small that doesn't breathe cloud. Or, at least, that would only breathe tiny puffs of cloud. A field mouse, I think. Velvet Remedy stopped, staring. A spell that turns a dragon into a field mouse? Yep. And how do we cast this spell? She queried. I'm pretty sure that's outside my scope of spellcraft. And we know it's outside of little pips. Rub it in, why don't you? I'm the one who found the spell. The not tricksy personality had said. I'm the one who cast it. Taken care of, Calamity grinned. Crazy Alicorn Lady already cast the spell. Well, sort of. Sort of, Velvet prompted. I wasn't sure if she was asking what he meant or correcting his grammar. Calamity assumed the former. The way I hear it, she used something that the Ministry of Magic came up with for her Ministry of Morale. A way to cast a spell and hold the effect on a trigger. Calamity rubbed a hoof against the back of his neck. To be precise, a way to cast a spell in a present. The spell goes off when the present is opened. She had a quirky name for it. Spell in a box, I guessed. Yep, Calamity said he's landed next to the set of cages labeled sanitation. That was it. I ducked under the table between us and trotted to him, glancing at the clipboard which hung next to the cages. For processing of dangerous, seediest materials, please read instructions carefully. From what I read, the empty cages once held trained parasprites, which had been ensorolated to eat words off of pages. I wondered if they only ate specific words, or if they rendered the whole book blank, and thus gloriously sedition-free. 
Makes sense, I thought aloud. With the thickness of the pink cloud down there, she probably couldn't approach the dragon and cast her spell herself. So, she had to cast a spell in a box. I wonder how she got it down there to the mother, though. She made a deal with a couple of the Candlelot dragons, Calamity said. Oh dear, Velvet said. No wonder her personalities were in crisis. She really was on the verge of re uh, rendering herself obsolete. How do you know all this? Shilu's asked. All fucking night. I take it the present hasn't opened yet. I looked at Calamity expectantly. So, that's what we have to do? That would mean sending steel hooves into the treasury. There wasn't another one of us who could survive it. Open a present without getting transfigured into a field mouse? Not exactly. What? I stared at Calamity in disbelief. We had gone up a level and were working our way through the brightly colored educational reform floor. As Calamity explained the plan, that the Alicorn in the Ministry of Arcane Sciences basement had devised. When Calamity was finished, I felt all reason had fled from the world. Who the hell tries something this important to the start of a gala? I huffed. That's insane. Calamity fixed me with a level stare. Behind him was a poster of Happy Foles playing in a cheerful looking schoolyard under the arch of a rainbow. What part of what you saw down in the basement screamed sanity to ya? I groaned, pressing the hoof to my face. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I got this. In order to stop the continuous replenishment of Pink Cloud, we have to trigger a spell in the box that will turn the treasury dragon into a field mouse. The trigger for the spell in the box has been rigged into the fireworks display for the Grand Galloping Gala. I remembered Pinkie Pie's endorsement on the Philadelphia Fun Fine posters in Steel Hoof's shack. Everything the Grand Galloping Gala should have been. Every day. Forever. In Equestria's final year, Princess Luna had given over the Grand Galloping Gala to Pinkie Pie. The fireworks had been rigged up with one of her instant party systems. But the gala had never happened. The mega spells rained down, and the life in Canterlot had ended. No more parties. And the trigger to set off the fireworks is in Princess Luna's private chambers in the royal castle. I understood now why Calamity said we needed to go to the castle. I was so frustrated, I could just scream. Why wasn't anything ever easy? How do we know if it worked? Velvet Emery asked. Asking Steelhoofs to wander into a dragon's lair and check had clearly never crossed her mind. Clamity pulled something out of his pack and spit it onto his hoof. With this, he held up a large pink gemstone with a flaw deep within it, an artificial flaw in the shape of a rune. Spell on a box goes off. This little darling lights up. I wonder if this was the it the alicorn had been searching for. You stole that on the way out of the basement, didn't you? Velvet asked rhetorically. A bob of red light appeared on the edge of my EFS compass. I spun, trying to spot the source. My ears perked, catching a low, unearthly hum. It sounded similar to the warping, grating sounds of a Ketalagul reviving, only softer, and caught on a single note like a broken recording. But there was nothing there. Just a short, colorful bookshelf, carved and painted with hearts and rainbows and prancing pony children. The bookshelf contained equally colorful books. The paint was peeling now, and two of the shelves had rotted through, spilling their contents to the floor. Above was a chalkboard with a sto story problem. In Sunshine's home of Ponyville, the reward for turning in a zebra Sympathizer is 500 bits. Sunshine reported her bad uncle yesterday, two zebra sympathizers today, and will report another tomorrow. If half the ponies she reported are proven to be zebra sympathizers, 
How many bits will she receive by the end of the week? A dark shadow formed on the blackboard, then bulged, pressing through it. A shadowy cloud that reached through the wall like a grasping claw. I froze, trying to process what I had just seen. The shadow cloud grew, moving towards us, splitting into multiple flowing tendrils. The unhollowed hum was coming from it, growing louder. The light began to dim, like the thing was devouring the illumination in the room. One tendril curled down, passing through a desk, totally insubstantial. The tail of it pulled out of the chalkboard, and the thing was fully in the room with us. I tried to kick on sats, but my targeting spell faltered, unable to lock on. Whoosh! The rocket from Steel Who's Battle Saddle arrowed past me, moving through the shadow as if it was really just a shadow. The rocket struck the far wall with a loud explosion of fire, dust, and colorful debris. The back blow knocked me down, toppling bookshelves through a table. The shadowy cloud barely reacted, its tendrils still reaching out towards each of us. I skittered back, away from the snaking shadow, certain of what would happen if it touched me. They eat your soul. Our weapons were useless against this creature. No armor would stop it. I was no longer surprised that all the steel rangers who had made it this far had perished here. Velvet Remedy cast her shield, wrapping the shadow cloud in her magic. He pressed his tendrils against the wall of the shield, the shadow molding over the surface, unable to get through. Velvet Remedy had contained it. No, them. The shadow was a swarm of tiny, jet-black necrosprites. They could pass through solid objects, but not magical fields. I shuddered, shakily releasing a breath I didn't realize I was holding. I'll keep them contained, Velvet said. You go on ahead. Pyrolite landed on her rump, looking insistent on staying. We nodded and ran off, leaving her holding the swarm. The book was here, in this room. I could feel it. I had been in Rarity's personal office before. It was much the same, although not on by the teeth of time. A dress pony stood in one corner of the room on an ornate chest. There was a note attached to the chest, written in Rarity's elegant script. Thoughts on the dress. The goal is to create elegant, yet functional armor of a moderate weight and classic style. I've chosen a color scheme of amaranth and gold that harkens back to the dress that my beloved friends created for me at the first gala so long ago. In honor of my dearest and closest friend, I'm drawing on my best skills at horticulture. That's wrong. <clears throat> the armored plating, particularly over the breast, will draw inspiration from the armor worn by the royal guards. I have woven a little magic into the dress, although only the metal plating will stop bullets. Cloth should hold up well against bladed weapons, as well as being resistant to the wear and tear of general dirtying. That I have come to expect from the battlefield or a gala. I jested that I might make a final version indestructible, but it was only a joke. I did, after all, tell Applejack that I would do no such thing, and besides, the reaction from my top magician would have been enough to put me off the idea, even if I had been serious. He was right, of course. With what I have done, I most likely would not have enough of a soul left to spare even a little of it. Anyway, I'm very pleased with my first pass, but the final dress needs to be even better, beyond mere perfection. The Grand Galloping Gala is still months away, so even with all the insanity here, I do have plenty of time. It is my most sincere hope that most, if not all, of my friends will be at the event this year. If so, I hope to convince them to allow me the honor of fashioning each one of them a similar, yet unique, elegant, Ministry Mayor armored dress. Normally, the gala would not be the venue I would choose to show off 
the first in what I'd hope a new line of fashionable armor. But this year, Pinkie Pie is finally living her dream, and has been put in charge of the event. So really, all bets are off. I floated out my screwdriver and bobby pin, picking the lock in the chest with relative ease. Opening it, I laid eyes on the armored dress. It was beautiful. I thought you said the book was in a desk, Calamity said, flying up from behind, from me, up to me from behind. Whoa, Nelly! Yeah, I whispered, pulling the armored dress out and looking it over. Uh, little Pip? Clemmy said timidly. Could, uh, could I have that? I didn't know you liked to wear dresses, Steelers intoned as he joined us. Clemmy spun around in the air. I don't, he insisted. It's for Velvet. I snickered as Steelhoof neighed mockingly. Of course you can, Calamity. She'll look exquisite in it. I passed the dress to Calamity and moved to the desk. I closed my eyes, drawing on the memory of how Rarity had opened the secret compartment. What other gems embedded in the front of the desk concealed the lock? Opening my eyes, I extended my magic over the desk. Moving Aside the gem, I began to pick the lock, this time using my magic. The lock was deceptively easy to pick, almost like the compartment wanted to be open. I slid open the hidden compartment. There, lying amongst the papers and detritus, like a sleeping dragon, was the dark tome, perfectly preserved. Its ancient pages filled with the most powerful and forbidden magic between covers of the blackest leather. I reached out with my magic, feeling a cold shock as I touched it. With my meager ability, the book promising to unlock greater powers and mysteries than I ever dreamed of. I didn't have to be a one-trick unicorn anymore. With this book, I could be magic if I wanted to. Powerful enough that I was worthy of being a bearer of that element. It was mine. A velvet remedy made her way to us slowly. Her horn was still glowing, and beads of sweat fell down her forehead. She was pouring much of her concentration into maintaining her shield, even though it was out of sight. Once we were outside, she would release it. The Necrosprite Swarm hadn't left the Ministry building in over two centuries. We were hoping it wouldn't now. We gave equal odds that remained here, drawn to the presence of the Black Book, like moths to the lantern. That either the magic woven into the Ministry walls, or the pink cloud, whatever, whatever. whatever. <clears throat> I turned to stare at the pony-sized poster in the wall. I'd seen it before on a massive billboard in Manhattan. I hadn't liked it much then. I liked it less now that I actually knew the zebra. Or knew a zebra. Ponies love laughter. Zebras do not understand joy and fear it. Ponies are honest. Zebras tell only lies. Ponies are loyal. Zebras will knife you in the back. Ponies are generous. Zebras are selfish and greedy. Ponies care about each other. Zebras care only for themselves. Okay, here's the plan, I said, knowing the others would not like this. <clears throat> Every pony else runs to the Ministry of Awesome. I'm going to slip into the Royal Castle and set off the Gala Fireworks. Alone? You're going to do what now? Not a chance. The responses I expected. No, little pip, Clamity said as he swooped close to me, backing me against a wall. I should do this. I'm faster. I'm more maneuverable. And I called it. This is my mission. I slipped out the MG Stealth Buck 2 and floated it before them. I can get it undetected, but it has to be me. Just me. I was the only one with a pit buck. There was no room for any discussion. Pony feathers, Clamity spit, bucking his hoof through the pony sized poster. If you find the goddesses, Velvet said slowly, 
still concentrating. I frowned. I didn't want to find the princesses. My mind conjuring nightmare images of their skeletons fused together in the throne room. And my heart stopped. Just for a moment. I wasn't sure I could find or handle finding them, seeing where they died. I certainly didn't want Velvet Remedy to bear witness to such a devastating horror. If I find the bodies of the princesses, that won't mean I found the goddesses. They're transcendent souls. I ignored Calamity's snort. But, you will tell me what you find, Velvet Remedy insisted. I really didn't want to. Promise me. I only nodded, feeling a tear form in my eye. I prayed to the goddesses that it wouldn't have to either honor that promise or break it. I begged them silently that I would find nothing. Clamity flew up to me again, this time the pink gem in his teeth. He tossed it to me. Now you gotta promise me something, he said softly. You gotta promise me you're gonna do this. See it through. I looked at him with surprise. I quickly nodded. Of course I would. I'm serious, Lil' Pip. I really want it to be me. He lowered his head, looking ashamed. I know it's in my heart, but my head needs convincing that we're still the good guys. I need this. I floated up the pink gem with its rune flaw. Then maybe you should hold on to this, I offered. That way, you'll know when it's done. Clement shook his head. As much as I'd love to, you might need it. Without it, how else will you know it's worked and y'all can come back? He looked away. No way I'm gonna have you leaving, just hanging there, to just satisfy myself. I nodded again and tucked the gemstone away. Clementy flew silently ahead. We moved into the stairwell and descended. The black book radiated an unpleasant coolness through one of my saddlebags. I was beginning to question whether I was really intending to give this to Trixie. Maybe my plan, whatever it was, needed a revision. Or maybe there was something inside the book that would take care of Trixie once and for all. What was it that Rarity told Applejack? That the black book contained magic to tear souls apart maybe maybe I could even save Twilight Sparkle ah I hurled the back brook against one of the pillars in the royal throne room I floated out another healing potion and down the contents hoping it would relieve the pounding in my head and the tightness in my chest the royal castle was filled with pink cloud thicker than outside. It had rotted away the tapestries, turning the carpets and deep drapestries into greasy residue, cracked and discolored the stained glass, and decayed the once royal furniture into collapsed heaps of debris. The golden fountain pools at the foot of the royal throne were tarnished beyond polishing and stagnant with thick pink sludge. At least there were no bones in here. No skeletons of Celestia and Luna. I knew I shouldn't have paused. I needed to keep moving. If I dallied, the pink would kill me. Or, the Stealth Buck 2 would die, and the Alicorns would kill me. But still, I had to stop. A curiosity strangling me. Threatening to kill me with razor claws if I didn't at least look inside the book. Just a peek. But I had stopped. I had stopped telling myself that I would just crack the cover open. That I was just making sure that Paris Price hadn't eaten the words off the pages. The black book was written in <clears throat> archaic zebra glyphs. Every damn page. The book wanted me to read it. I was sure if I studied it, the answer would come to me in dreams. But that didn't help me now. The little pony in my head was throwing a tantrum. Red lights moved around on my EFS compass. I clamped my muzzle closed, biting my lower lip. Stupid, stupid, stupid! I dashed over, retrieving the book. 
quivering at the frosty surge I felt from it whenever I touched it with magic. Two alicorns stepped into the throne room, their shields up. As far as I could tell, the alicorns in the castle never dropped their shields. They seemed more resistant to the pink cloud, but they were not immune. And with the cloud's concentration here, they were limiting their exposure. I crouched behind the throne, hiding, even though I was invisible. I could feel the cloud eating at my insides, gnawing at my muscles, clamping down on my lungs and heart, seeping into my bowels. I already wanted another healing potion, but I had to hold off or I would run out. Princess Luna's private chambers couldn't be far. I could probably make it in a short gallop if these two would just leave, or at least move so their shields weren't blocking the Celestia damn doorway. I don't see anything, one said, turning to her companion, but I feel something. The room feels colder than it was before. What the hell? Was the Black Book a damn refrigerator? No, that made no sense. The safe it was in would have been freezing. Was the Alicorn sensing something metaphysical? I slowly wondered how Pinkie Pie would have responded to the proximity of the Black Book. I feel nothing different, the other said, at least partially confirming my suspicions. We should inform Nightseer. She will know what to make of our sensitivity. The Alicorn took one last look around. One of them walking up to the throne, tilting her head and looking straight at me. Through me. There is nothing here, she said, turning back and rejoining her sister. We go. The door to Princess Luna's chambers were sealed with a lock almost identical to the one that had secured Princess Celestia's room back in her school. A very tricky lock, but familiarity helped me open it swiftly. I pushed open the door with a hoof and stepped swiftly away as thick pink cloud rolled out of the doorway. The cloud was pooled with here in lethal concentrations. I could barely make out the ceiling, which I noticed formed a once beautiful mosaic of light blue sky with wisps of cloud and cheery sun. I couldn't make out the far wall at all. I floated out a healing potion, drinking it. I felt it repairing my heart and lungs, taking the edge off my thudding in my head. My stomach settled. I took a deep breath. I charged into the room, my horn glowing to provide light. I was looking for the pressure switch for the gala. Immediately, my heart tries to seize. My lungs lost their catch of air as I began to choke. I felt like a thousand tiny spiders had hatched in my intestines and were spreading throughout my insides. I found her bed, closet, dressers, but I didn't see the switch. I dashed for the doorway as those spiders started to bite and sting. I slammed the door closed behind me, pulling out two healing potions and downing them. As my mind cleared, I realized I had only one healing potion left, plus a super restoration potion, and they needed to it to make at least one more run through the room. I nudged open the door, stepping back again. I lowered myself, preparing to run. A spot of red appeared on my EFS compass. I moaned, shaking. I hoped the invisibility spell would hold out. The last thing I wanted right now was a fight. Come out, come out, my little pony. The Alicorn's majestic voice rang in my head as well as my ears. I turned and watched as she ascended the staircase behind me and stepped into the room with me. She was one of the forest green alicorns, but her coat was so dark it appeared sheer ebony. Her mane and tail followed behind her like plasma, rippling in a non-existent wind. She wore armor made of bones, a saddle fashioned from a pony's ribcage, with, winged, uh, with wing bones splayed out across her own. From her neck hung a pony's skull with an exceptionally long, slender horn. Thick wisps of pool, a pooled plink cloud, rolled along the floor from Princess Luna's chamber behind me, curling around my hooves. I felt myself trembling. The alicorn stopped, looking right at me. 
then looked about the rest of the room, her horn glowing as she slid a small knife out of her armor. The knife hovered a moment before whipping around, slashing two deep cuts across my shoulder, or her own shoulder. The alicorn began to bleed. My eyes widened, but I couldn't stare at her self-inflicted wounds. My eyes were pulled back to the pony's skull with its long, slender horn. The alicorn cast her spell, and the blood from her wound began to drip upwards, flowing out into the air, swirling and pooling. Her eyes glowed as the twin pools of floating blood forged themselves into wicked, curving blades. I felt myself tremble again, not with weakness, but with horror. I knew that horn. I had seen it before, in a memory. Sister, you called for me? The twin blood swords launched through the air, spinning, slashing at me. One glancing off my barding, bouncing away. The other cut a deep wound across the left side of my neck. Blood began to pour down my armor and left foreleg. I hissed in pain, staggering. Oh yes, I see you, my little pony. The alicorn laughed from behind her shield. Did you really think you could hide from Nightseer with your pathetic little invisibility toy? What a silly little pony. The blood swords spun back through the air at me. I felt another chill as I pulled out the black book, deflecting one of the swords with it as the other struck against my armor with enough force to bruise. The first sword disintegrated into flakes of rutted power as it rebounded from the book. Oh, what do you have there? The alicorn purred. What do you... I grunted, feeling a wave of weakness and nausea. I was losing blood. I needed to take the healing potion before I bled out, but... The other blade of blood slashed around. I countered out of the way, the edge barely missing my muzzle. I floated the black book up, trying to strike it, but the blade dodged away, returning to its mistress. I tried to keep my eyes locked onto the blood sword, but my gaze slid from it, latching again onto the side of that skull, that slender horn. This, this is going to be the Luna Academy for young alicorns? A magical school of my very own? Just like yours? The ribs, the wings, the skull with its slender horn. I knew they were all from the same pony. The blades straightened out and shot straight at me, aimed between my eyes. At the last moment, I magically tossed the black book in front of my face. Red mist poured from its edges. The sword dissolved as it struck the black leather cover. I believe I will be taking that. Nightseer focused, rubbing her magic around the book. Her shield faltered for a moment as she felt the cold shock of the book's aura, but only for an eye blink, not long enough for me to take any advantage of it. You dare? I was trembling even harder now, but not from weakness or horror. The alicorn took the black book, easily prying it from the grip of my telekinesis. But I didn't care. The black book was nothing to me, not compared to what Nightseer wore around her neck like a trophy. And you die, she said casually, almost yawning as she took the book for herself. Motes of magic formed around her, fashioning themselves into eldritch knives. My legs gave out. I dropped to my knees. They splashed into a thin pool of my own blood that was becoming saturated in pink. My lungs were burning, my head throbbing harder. I didn't care. Be unwavering. I focused on that skull with his long, slender horn. The host of the magical knives darted through the air at the target. Nightseer glanced downward, and she felt her necklace shift. With a telekinetic thrust, I drove Luna's horn through the soft tissue under Nightseer's muzzle, and up into her brain. She twitched once, the spark of life remaining in her just long enough 
for her eldritch knives to strike home. Most evaporated against my new barding, but several sunk deep before vanishing along with Nightseer's shield spell as the Alcorn crumbled to the ground. No healing potions left. No super restoration potions left. Almost every unarmored part of my body wrapped in healing bandages. I faced Princess Luna's private quarters. The room filled with thickly pink. The black book was once again in my saddlebags, but my sense of obsession was fading, overpowered by other emotions. Just like the chill from the book was overpowered by the heat of the fire behind me. I had stripped Luna's bones from Nightseer, and I was burning them. It was the only semblance of a proper burial I could offer. I faced Princess Luna's private chambers, and continued to pray. The smoke from the fire behind me curled around me, black and acerid. The pink cloud floated out of the doorway in front of me, in wisps. The smoke pushed its way inside as more of the cloud flowed outward, forcing me to slowly step back until I could feel the heat of the fire against my tail. I jumped as I heard a boom of thunder inside Princess Luna's chambers. The ceiling mosaic had changed, the puffy white clouds growing thick and dark. A moment later, it began to rain inside Luna's room, the sudden deluge washing the pink out of the air. I heard it gurgling out small vents on the floor. Shaking, I began to laugh. I looked upwards and shouted, Thank you! The goddesses had heard me and answered my prayers. Either that, or this was the most peculiar design for fire protection ever. Galloping into the pouring rain, I looked about. Finding the switch was easy now. I threw my hooves against the pressure plate, then spun to face the chamber's only window, jumping up onto the dilapidated remains of Luna's bed to keep my hooves out of the pink water that flooded the floor. Outside the window, I could hear pops and bangs. A ribbon of glittering gold light shot through the air and burst into a prismatic spray of light. I fished up the pink gemstone just in time to see its soft glowing fading. Success. The gem's light died, and I saw the rune inside had burned out, replaced by a blackened smear within the stone. I jumped on Luna's bed, squealing with glee as another light exploded outside the window, showering down on Canterlot with all the colors of Celestia's flowing mane. I knew that there were more fireworks going off than I could see. Many more. For a moment, the thunderous explosions rivaled the sounds of a hundred steel hooves firing away, then exceeded it. I shifted away from the window, eager now to get back to my friends. On the opposite wall, I saw them, a collection of Ministry Mayor statuettes, all six, gathered together, just like they should be, lined up in, crystal display, in a crystal display case. I realized that only Luna and Spike had kept intact collections. Even Rarity has separated the ponies in her set, giving herself to her sister Sweetie Belle, keeping Fluttershy with her wherever she went. I wrap my magic around the case, taking it with me. Will you look at all this stuff? Calamity said, in a tone of awe. Watcher had told us that the Ministry of Awesome had been repurposed into a warehouse, but I had never pictured this. The interior walls had been knocked out. The entire building was a gigantic black void, filled with seemingly endless rows of crates, filing cabinets, and metal boxes. The rows were divided into clear sections that stretched the length of the building, each section filled with containers painted a single color. Small diamond-shaped lights hung from the ceiling at intervals, many of which had burnt out. The effect was like staring down the length of a rainbow under a black sky sprinkled with stars. Are y'all seeing all of this? Yes, we've already said, staring. 
Can we just... No, I answered. It would take forever, and there was no way we could carry it all. How about just one row? Calamity pleaded. No, I looked around. What are we looking for is behind a shield and behind the fences. I don't think it's in this room, which means it's probably below us. Fan out and look for a way down. Well, shoot. Y'all are no fun. Clementy complained as he flew off. Pyrolite swooped into the air, a streak of emerald and gold between the rainbows and darkness. Velvet, hold up, I said, as she and Steelhoos began to trot down rows in the yellow sections and green section, respectively. Velvet stopped, turning towards me. Then, unable to help herself, she struck a pose. Admiring it? She cooed. Isn't this just lovely? She was wearing the armor Calamity had given her. When I first saw her in it, my heart had skipped a beat. Now that she was posing, my heart skipped another. She grinned, watching my expression. Or, do you prefer this? She dropped down into a sultry, pouty pose, and my heart threatened to stop altogether. I felt suddenly hot. I... I... Um... Wow. She beamed. Damn it. This wasn't fair. I wasn't supposed to be thinking like this about Velvet Remedy anymore. I needed homage. So, how do I look? Lickable. I whimpered. She blinked innocently. What was that? Pretty. I coughed, blushing. Very, very pretty. And armored, which is good. Good you finally have some armor. She gave me a charming laugh, getting up. Why, thank you, little Pip. Looking up at the spot... Looking up at the spot of air Calamity had recently occupied, she purred. I really hope I can get the same response from our flybuck. Our barded bard, I said, gazing at her. The remedy face hoofed, and I shook her and shook her head. I was waiting for some pony to say that. It had to be you, didn't it, little Pip? I started, realizing that I'd forgotten why I called to hold her back. I have a gift for you. She blinked, putting down her hoof. Really? You'd think it was my birthday. She watched as I pulled out a warped bundle with a slightly chiding tone. Is it a weapon? No, I said, slightly wounded. But this is very, very special. And you have to promise not to take it apart or remove anything from it. Ever. Velvet Remedy now looked curious and slightly worried. Promise, I required. It's important. All right, little Pip. I can see that it is, at least to you. I promise. I floated the bundle over to her, unwrapping the crystal case from Princess Luna's bedroom. Velvet Remedy gasped, her eyes going immediately to Fluttershy. She reached out with her magic to take the case, and I heard a sharp intake of air as the magic of each of the Philoes flooded over her at once. Back in the royal castle, picking up the case had not had any effect on me, but then I had already possessed a full set. They were already giving me what they had to give. I kept the net of levitation magic beneath the crystal case, just in case, as a precaution, should the gifts of the statuettes be overwhelming. Velvet Remedy's eyes widened, first with alarm, then understanding. Where? she asked, her voice trembling a little. There were tears in her eyes. Princess Luna's private chambers. These were here hers. Now, they're yours. And did you find any? Just bones, I said sadly. Their spirits have gone elsewhere. I didn't say any more. Lil Pip, you're four! Calamity shouted as I emptied little Macintosh into the body, 
of the Ultra Sentinel, penetrating its armor, but failing to take it down. It rolled closer, moving fully onto the aisle of red or orange boxes and cabinets. I spun, terrified to see another of the rainbow-painted robot tanks bearing down on me from behind, the turret of its main gun locking onto me. Wrapping myself in a field of levitation, I kicked off the ground. Both Ultra Sentinels fired at me with high-explosive anti-tank guns, slaying each other. Boom! 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 The next aisle over, Steelhoops was facing at least two more, opening up with his grenade machine gun. The tanks were taking the battering, firing back with a multi-gem, rapid-fire magical energy gun. The scream of the magical energy weapons dampened as one of the tanks went down. The flickering orbs of energy above my head and calamities popped as Velvet Army's disintegration ward saved Steelhoofs from being turned to ash. Steelhoofs fired several more grenades, then retreated around a corner, smoke curling off his armor. Several plates of the armor were gone, taking melted flesh with them, leaving gaping wounds that seeped with the dark fluid that formed Cantalagul's blood. He stumbled in pain. The missile launcher in his battle saddle was half disintegrated. More than just a diet of scrap metal would be needed to repair the damage. Clemente started to reach back for Spitfire's thunder, but I waved him off. My EFS compass was completely red, solid, no matter what direction I turned. There's got to be a hundred of those things in here, Calamity. And this was not the first line of defense. The goddesses knew what else was in here. We aren't going to fight our way through all this. You need to find the controls and shut the security down. You're the only one of us who can. I whipped out my sniper rifle. I loaded the magically enhanced bullets and floated over the top of the shelves and crates, taking aim at a badly damaged tank bot which had sent Steel Who's Running. The multi-gem magical energy weapon swung upwards on the universal joint, aiming all its barrels at me. We opened fire together. My new armor took the first four of the five shots it got off into the space. It took me once to fire. The fifth blast of magical energy struck me like a ball of molten steel, burning into my chest. Unbearable agony exploded in my chest, and my rib cage saved my heart, but at the cost of one of my ribs disintegrating completely. My magic imploded as I dropped. Simultaneously, the bullet from my sniper rifle struck directly into the center of the tank bot's magical energy weapon, ripping through its matrix core. The top of the Ultra Sentinel bot exploded in a flash of multicolored energy. My body hit the shelf full of orange metal boxes, like a rag doll, bouncing off and landing hard on the floor amongst the jagged shards of the slain tank bot. I felt one shard slice into my armor, jabbing onto my stomach, but not deeply. An odd static-like detonation echoed a few rows over. Steelhoofs let out a scream, more of rage than pain, as I heard his metal armor collapse to the floor. I groaned an indescribable pain in my chest. I was having trouble breathing. They're changing tactics again, Velvet Remedy yelled from somewhere further away. Lil... The air filled with the sound of crackling explosions. A wash of charged energy flooded the aisle, bathing me, making the hairs of my coat and mane stand on end. My eyes forward sparkle winked off. I twisted around slowly, lifting my pit buck, it was dead. Matrix disruption grenades. That meant steel hooves was immobile, and my pit buck was just a metal part of my leg until I could reboot it, which might be tricky without steel hooves armor to reboot it from. I heard the metallic whine of, and rumble as another ultra sentry rolled up to my aisle. I tried to flip my sniper rifle up to fire at it, only to realize I didn't have it anymore, and I wasn't sure where it was. It must have fallen onto the other row. This rainbow painted tank bot had a grenade launcher as its primary weapon, probably the one that had just sprayed the area with matrix disruption grenades. The secondary weapon 
was an integrated, high-powered rifle, and it was swinging around aiming at me. I focused. The glow of my horn, surrounding dozens of crates and metal boxes on each side of the aisle. I couldn't dislodge the tank box spark battery before I could fire, but I could float enough crap in its way to act as a shield. The tank downpowered. Yeehaw! That's how we do it up in the sky! The shimmering field of magenta magical energy surrounding all about one fourth of the basement. The shield was easily as powerful as the super eloquent shield in Philadelphia. Velvet Remedy took a deep breath, looking a little nervous, then stepped forward. The direct ascendant of Sweetie Belle passed through the shield unharmed. It didn't even fizzle or frizz her mane. She turned back to us, letting out a deep breath, looking relieved. This part was easy. Actually explaining to Velvet what she needed to do to disable the generator was more difficult than bypassing the shield myself. I motioned her on with my hoof. At this point, the only thing that could go wrong is if she ran out of air inside there before deactivating the generator. Nothing that seemed remotely likely. A few minutes later, the shield melted away. Velvet stood at the down power generator in the center, looking accomplished. In here were the greatest secrets of the Ministry of Vossum. I turned to Calamity, who was prancing in the air like a filly who had just got in her cutie mark. Hate to do this to you, Calamity, but would you please go to get the Sky Bandit? His face fell. I actually felt bad for him. What? Now? But. But all. Steel Hooves can't mew. move. My pit buck is dead. We can't go back the way we came. We need to risk a landing right in front of the Ministry of Awesome. This was insane, but I couldn't think of another way. Fortunately, we had seriously thinned out the alicorns on Ministry Walk, and the fireworks had scattered most of the rest. There was no telling for how long, though. Clarity looked disappointed, almost grievously wounded at my request. I looked at him seriously. You're the fastest and most maneuverable amongst us, and only one who can bring us a ride. Get the Sky Bandit and position yourself up above the cloud. Take my binoculars and keep an eye out for us. The moment we're out, swoop down and get us. All right, dang it, he said, dejectedly. I floated out the pink gemstone with the scorch mark inside. This is yours. It's done. Clamity smiled wanly. Thank you, Lil Pip. I owe you one. He slipped the gem back into his pack looking a little better. The orange maned pegasus in the desperado hat pivoted and flew away, casting one look back at the treasures he was being denied. I hope sacrifice is a virtue. I rotated and looked at the crates and cabinets before me. On one end of the previously shielded area was a mainframe and several terminals. In the center, under a spotlight, was a stand with a small lockbox. The sort used to hold memory orbs. I gasped as I saw the symbol emblazoned on the lockbox. A burning hoof. Minutes later, I was laying on the floor of the Ministry of Awesome, staring at the contents of the burning hoof lockbox. Six memory orbs. Each sat in a plush velvet indentation with a symbol pinned underneath. An apple, a butterfly, a star, a balloon, a cloud with a lightning bolt, and, finally, a diamond. I took a deep breath, then leaned forward and touched my horn to the first one. The lightning cloud orb. I felt my host swallow nervously as she walked into the darkened circular chamber. Huge arched windows stretched upwards, giving a breathtaking view of a brilliant star night. A circular window above the arches perfectly framed the moon. Moonlight fell through the chamber to illuminate a large round table. There were seven chairs, six with emblems embrazened on their backs, one of which was taller than the others, and inlaid with obsidian and lapis lazuli. 
My host strode up to the chairs, looking at the table. The chairs were cushioned in red. The same emblem on the back of the chair was also inlaid into the table before them, where a dinner plate might be set. To my host's left was the image of gears and sparks, bisected with a blade, the symbol of the Seattle Rangers and the Ministry of Wartime Technology. To her right was the image of a large star ringed with smaller ones, a tall horn above them and wings to each side, the symbol of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. Directly across the table, I could see overlaid with a butterfly. My host didn't look at the others. The rest of the table was taken up with a map of Equestria. There were markings indicating battle lines where the zebras had managed to push into the country. Most of the war, however, had been waged in the zebra's homeland and in the seas and lands between. My host's gaze lingered on the small part of Equestria that had been lost, including a crescent-shaped valley. Littlehorn Valley. All over the map of Equestria, tall mushroom-shaped models had been placed. At first, I thought they marked Balefire Bombs, but then I realized they were white, and their stalks were tall and needle-thin. Towers. Some pony flew overhead, picking up one of the towers in her teeth and moving it about half an inch. The Philadelphia Tower should be on that side of the city, Rainbow Dash said, as she landed on the opposite side of the table, sitting down in one of the chairs. The symbol in front of it was almost identical to her cutie mark, but with purple wings lined in black. I could see that symbol on one of her Shadow Bolt's uniforms. Where should I see it? My host asked, her voice holding a reserved country twang. Rainbow Dash shrugged. Why not sit in your sister's chair? I'm sure AJ wouldn't mind. Eppelum's eyes widened. I couldn't do that. The door opened, and Princess Luna strode into the room. I felt a javelin skewer my heart. Eppelum and Rainbow Dash both bowed as the princess took her chair at the head of the table. Good night, Rainbow Dash. Welcome back, Eppelum. Eppelum gulped. Please, up. I didn't want her to stand back up. This was painful. I was in the presence of Luna, my goddess, living and well, not an hour after having burned her bones, having seen her defiled by an alicorn. I wished for Applebloom to remain bowed, or at least look away. Applebloom stood back up, realizing Rainbow Dash had already been standing and turned her attention to the princess. It's good to hear you are finally doing something with that ministry I gave you, Rainbow Dash, the princess said, chiding a little. Now tell me about this new project. It seems vast. Oh yeah, Rainbow Dash grinned, flopping her wings. It seems she couldn't remain seated long. Remember how you told me you wanted my help building the equestrian sky guard? Well, here's my answer. The single Pegasus project. Sounds impressive, Princess Luna said patiently. What is it? In a word, weather control. Last two words, Applebloom whispered to the Cyan Pegasus, who shot her a look. The single Pegasus project was weather control? Well, I guess that made some sense. If the Enclave was able to alter the towers so they could plant crops in the clouds, Weather control? Luna said, tilting her head curiously, echoing my thoughts. Then, taking them into a whole different direction, so, this project would allow us to rain lightning down on enemy positions, mire their convoys with torrent downpours, drive them back with hurricanes and hail? Rainbow Dash's jaw nearly hit the floor. She closed it, zipping around the room. Oh, yeah! This would even be, uh, this is even more awesome than I thought. I mean, I knew it would be awesome, but I never realized just how awesome it would be. Princess Luna chuckled. Oh, goddess, I loved that chuckle. I was in awe of it. Then what were you thinking of using it for? Rainbow Dash stopped in mid-loop and hovered, turning back to the princess as she shook off a blush. 
Well, the way I see it, this war will be won through air superiority. No offense to Twilight. I mean, we have it. They don't. She flew up to the table. Problem is, we don't have enough combat flyers. Especially now that the zebras are using dragons. There simply aren't enough pegasi, because they're all too busy already keeping control of the weather. And the ones that we do have often have to leave to other obligations. Hell, even I have to abandon the war once a year to help Ponyville wrap up winter. Surely some other Pegasus, Princess Luna started to say, but Rainbow Dash interrupted her. Not a chance. They need me. I won't leave Ponyville hanging. Princess Luna looked cross for just a moment, then smiled and nodded. Of course. She looked back at the map. She bid. Continue. Well, with a single Pegasus project, we're going to finally automate all of our weather making and weather control systems. The towers you see here will control the weather over each area. The wild, rainbow-maned Pegasus grinned broadly, almost dancing with anticipation. Check this out. Rainbow Dash pulled a little switch and tossed it. Both Apple Loom and Princess Luna jumped as a crack of thunder roared over the table, and black rings of smoke expanded out from each of the model towers, crackling with energy. That would start rain. Having seen a downpour from Princess Luna's ceiling, I was mildly surprised when miniature clouds didn't form and start flooding the table. I designed it, to, it after the controls of the Wonderbolts, Rainbow Dash boasted. Everything about the single Pegasus project goes through me, and it doesn't get my hoof of approval unless it's cool. I felt my host's eyes roll. And it will all be under the management of one single Pegasus in the Rainbow Dash hub of pure awesome. We're still deciding on a name, Apple Bloom said quickly, interjected by Princess Luna's uh, odd expression. Rainbow Dash looked a little put off. Hey, this is my project and my ministry. Anyway, Apple Bloom said, taking over. The pony in the central hub will be placed into a sort of induced coma. Induced coma? Princess Luna said, sounding shocked. We haven't exactly worked out that part either, Abloom continued, admittedly. But we're really close, Rainbow Dash interjected swiftly. Abloom's company is working on modifying a laugh support pod, and I'm going to be talking to Twilight and Rarity to see if they have any ideas that could help. I see. The princess didn't sound fully convinced. And hook up one of our new Crusader computers, Apple continued, only to have Rainbow Dash interrupt again. Yeah, but none of that download your brain nonsense. I have them disconnect all that stuff. I want a living pony running Equestria's weather, not some machine that thinks it's a pony. Apple Bloom sighed, then continued once more. The pony in the last support pod will be mentally linked to the Crusader, which will allow her to manage running all of Equestria's weather. Does it have to be a Pegasus? The princess asked. Yes, Rainbow Dash proclaimed. Well, no, not technically, but it should be. Princess Luna looked over the map and all its towers, at least four dozen in all. You have given me a lot to think about. This would be a massive expenditure of resources but totally worth it, Rainbow Dash pushed, sounding hopeful. Princess Luna nodded. Most likely, she agreed with a smile. And I believe the Ministry of Morale and Image could have proposals that could be integrated into this. The princess stood. And the central hub will be a prime target for assault. So it would be best to def it would be so it would need the best defenses that the Ministry of Arcane Sciences and Warm Technology can devise. But, it'll still be my project, right? Rainbow Dash asked. It will still be the Ministry of Awesome. Of course.